The historical method is always a tricky thing, right? Because there will be people like Bart Ehrman will say, well, we can at least say so-and-so happened, but we can't say it was a miracle. And I would say that I agree that purely based on history, you can't necessarily, but I also think that you have to have philosophy and epistemology to do history. You have to have criteria. There's a great book published by Dr. Candy Brown at Indiana University, which is actually where I went to college. She is a religious studies professor, and she did a book published by Harvard University Press on prayer, on testing prayer. And she actually has cases of prayer healings of, like she has one of a woman who was uh, medically deaf where we have her um, audiography uh, tests in 2004, when she was legally like disabled, was on pinch and all that. She was prayed for at a Pentecostal meeting. Her hearing instantly came back. She went to her doctor and we have her post prayer test and it's significantly better. Then we tested her again several years later and it was still better. There's a, it's, a, it's a small tourist site and they have a document that allegedly was written by Jesus is in Japanese and Jesus says that he went to Japan he learned Shintoism the art of ninja he didn't get crucified but his brother Izukiri which is a very Japanese name for a first century Jew uh, got crucified in his place Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And uh, today I'm joined by Caleb Jackson. And um, your channel, where can everybody go and find that? Yeah, proselytize or apostatize. I'm actually wearing the hat. Uh, nice. it's, a, it's a podcast that I co-host with some people. We do theistic debates and conversations. We have a lot of open mic nights and panels. So yeah, you all are welcome to stop by sometime and, and talk and converse. Everyone's welcome. So. Nice. That's always a great thing. I'm also an author of two books. Uh, my first book called Undead is on the resurrection. This is the old cover. There's an updated cover, but there's that one. And I have another one on theodicy that is called Searching for a Solution to Suffering. Um, and I'm working on a third book right now on miracles. So I'm excited for, for that one to come out. And that one might be fairly long. So uh, we'll see how that goes. But yeah, I'm glad to be here and to, to be on all these different podcasts and just to have really uh, productive discussions, talk about history and theology and all that. So thanks for having me. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And uh, what what exactly kind of Christian art do you consider yourself? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. So I typically don't really try to associate with particular denominations or labels. So sure. I, I'm I'm non denominational, although some people will say that itself is a denomination. But I won't uh, I won't quibble on that stuff. But as far as my theology goes, I'm I, I think I'm more of a moderate. Um, I have really conservative friends who think that I'm too liberal and I have really liberal friends who think I'm too conservative. So that's, totally <laughs> good. that's a good thing to note. Like that's, that means you're doing something right. I think so. I think so. I, I think that success is not just based on how many people agree with you, but also how many people disagree with you. If you do something that everybody agrees with, then it's <clears> not, it's probably not that challenging or stimulating, you know? So um, I, I guess some more interesting I, uh, ideas. So I'm not a, I'm not what I would consider to be a fundamentalist per se. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a theistic evolutionist and all that stuff. I don't necessarily um, hold dogmatically to inerrancy and stuff like that. I'm not saying I outright reject it, but I don't take hard stances on things like that. Um, I, I try to put history and and um, empiricism before the creeds and the dogmas. So although I do hold to most of the concepts, um, I don't try to hold to them as if it's unfalsifiable or nothing would ever shake my faith on this, right? I try to be... I. And I've tried, I've gotten better because the first stuff I started writing was very apologetical. And although I still like apologetics, I want to be someone who is promoting what I think is true. And if that ends up being apologetical, fine. But um, I do want to look at the evidence as fairly as I think I can. Right. Um, right. So that that's kind of how I, I typically consider that. So. No, and I'm thinking of my, my, my own self, my own life. When I was a Christian, I considered myself non-denominational as well. Hmm. But when I look back at it, I was probably more in line with evangelical, Baptist, but mm -hmm. call ourselves born again, I guess. Right. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, conservative, m mostly Trump voters in, in that mm -hmm. church. And um, but you're a little bit on your different. You're a little more liberal than that. Yeah, I don't, I'm not not necessarily polit politics. I'm at, well, politically, I'm actually a libertarian. So I'm kind of that's also kind of in the middle. Yeah. Um, but I, I do think it's I'm not appreciating this trend of hardcore evangelicals becoming very um becoming like 
you know, Republicanism is the only way and the right. Democrats are not just wrong, but they're literally ordained by the devil. There are people who will say that right. um, or, 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 for, or evangelicals believing in like QAnon or, you know, really ridiculous conspiracy theories or prophesying that God is going to give Trump a second term and, and all this. Stuff. I just think it, it's just ridiculous. And I think that really when you look at the history of Christianity, um, it wasn't until the last half century with people like Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson and Oral Roberts and others who were like promoting this really hard Christian nationalism, conservatism. Most of Christian history didn't look anything like that. In fact, in, in Europe, Christianity looks almost entirely different. And so I don't think the earliest Christians would have even recognized the very right wing kind of anti-immigrant uh, Christianity that we see in America today. That's a really good point. And a, a lot of a lot of right wing Christians say don't even realize that this whole constitutional republic that we have to have in place that was a liberal movement to begin with right. yeah. so that was like anti-church that came out of an anti-church mentality and now all of a sudden the christians are holding on to that like it's the baby yes exactly so very interesting it's ironic almost that that's how it ended up it is yeah yeah the fundamentals ended up being the ones that are obsessed with the constitutional republic whereas in the history was the church that was more of like not exactly they, they, they weren't exactly more nationalists it was more of mm. a uh, internationalist movement it yeah like, and it yeah the church was i mean the church was persecuted for most of its first couple of years of existence up until constantine so they weren't like super pro-rome and all this stuff exactly. they were just like i mean paul does paul does say you know obey your government stuff like that so they weren't like anarchists but they, right. they submitted to the government but they weren't so like they were still willingly saying we disagree with this and we stand up to this. But Christians now were like, oh, yes, America is God's chosen country. And, and they're almost uh, elevating nationalism to their theology, where it's like literally if yeah. you're anti-American, you're anti-Christian. And I think that's just such an arrogant and strange way to look at it. And I like I just don't see that. It, it, it's, it's like if you I can't imagine the Apostle Paul. Well, they didn't have cars back then. Let's say he had a chariot having uh, not my emperor for Nero. And Nero was literally killing Christians. <laughs> Nero was like literally kill it was treating and, and Christians have this persecution mentality today where which is weird. To, I mean, like I understand that there's freedom of speech issues and stuff like that that I want to support. But of course, most people in elected office in America are at least professing Christians. Um, Americans still said that the, an atheist is the least likely. They would rather vote for a Democrat or any other de uh, person than an atheist in polls. So I don't know why people are acting as if. Christians are persecuted. Yes, Christians are dropping percentage wise in the in the electorate, but most of them aren't antagonistic towards Christianity. They're just kind of indifferent towards it. So uh, right. this persecution complex, because we can't say Christmas on our Starbucks cups anymore, when you have people literally getting executed in Paul's day, and Paul still said, yes, pay your taxes, obey your government. So and, and yet Christians here are, are storming the Capitol, because they don't like more minute policy so I, I just all of that to me is is, is interesting when you, well you had christians being fed the lions that was yes. persecution now it's like their their politician didn't get in that's yes right but yeah that's the big and biden is a catholic i mean i know some people don't count it as that but he's not like yeah. he's this like secularist or they're all like they're this. all catholics or something i know <laughs> so the entire so government except for like two people are, are christian or catholic yeah you got a Muslim, you got a couple Muslims, and then you got a couple of Jews, and then there's like one atheist. I think Andrew Yang is the only one. Yeah, I don't think he even likes using the term. Even Bernie Sanders isn't like a religious Jew, but he when they asked him, Are you an atheist? He was like, No. I don't think anyone would come out and say it even if they were, because I think that would be a headline yeah. that they would just run against them and it would make them look bad. So Yeah, especially in America. At least not, at least not today, maybe in fifty years, but I I don't not 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 in America as as it currently stands. Yeah, so, so we were mentioning the early Christians being persecuted and really persecuted. I think we should go there. We should start with yeah. that. Let's go back a little bit. But I actually want to go back before that. If okay. you were, I don't know if you know about this, but the term Christ, the term Christos, was first brought in through the, the translation of the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament. Mm -hmm. when they, uh, so, and which would be, when they're talking about King David, that's right. where, the, where they use the word anointed in there. And so when it got translated from Hebrew to Greek, it went from Mosiach to Christos. So now all of a sudden, this Christos concept is being tossed around. This is, this is 200, 300 years before Christianity even came about. But I think it got the ball rolling because I think the Messianic movement starts then. Because now all of a sudden you have these Hellenistic Jews 
who are like bringing concepts. Maybe they're maybe they're used to hearing about the Illusionian mysteries, or maybe they're used to hearing about Osiris in Egypt. But regardless, I think that the, there was a world, a globalized concept of a Messiah starting to happen in Egypt, in Syria, in Greece, in Turkey. And I think because of the Jews bringing that about and Hellenizing and, or becoming Hellenized, like you look at Philo, and this is now we're going to jumping up a little bit. This is the first century. But by the time, by the time you get to Philo, you're seeing a perfect example of a Hellenized Jew who is talking about a Messiah being a divine heir to a kingdom of heaven, basically. And it's like the soil is there for it to grow, basically. I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, so the concept of Messiah, at least within first century Palestine, was typically of like a, as you were saying, a Davidic uh, uh, descendant of someone who would defeat the Romans and take it back, almost like a war here, basically the next King David, and he would rule the throne. And that's when, you know, during the Messianic age, that's when the resurrection would happen and the new heavens and new earth and all that stuff. So that's, I think, what people were looking for. And there were plenty of Messianic movements before and after Christ. You could look at the Bar Kokhba revolts and Simon Bar Giora and, and others, and they all failed. Um, the they all were executed. Yeah. And Maccabees as well. Yeah, Maccabees. A little bit before that, but yeah, Maccabees as well. So I'm not, people, I'm not mistaken, Judas Maccabee was called Messiah while he was alive. And then when he died, they were like, nah, maybe not. <laughs> I'm not he mistaken. may, he may have been. Him. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he may have been. I don't know. Did you, doesn't Josephus call like Vespasian the Messiah or something? Yeah, like, it it yeah. yeah. So yeah, so it was, it, was this, it was this military leader kind of, of, of what that is. And it's interesting because you see Jesus in uh, in the Gospels that there are a couple of points where they, they want to make him king and have this rise up. And Jesus is like, no, we don't want to do that. Um, but that's also, I think, what the, the term king of the Jews when he's crucified is because Josephus talks about um, seditious people who are claiming to be kings. And that's why they're executed, because, you know, being a king would not, you know, when, when they accuse another, like the Pharisees say, well, we have no king but Caesar. So um, and of course, they don't personally believe that because they hated the Romans, but they were just, you know, sucking up to, to them to get rid of Jesus. So, uh, yeah, I, th I think the reason Jesus was uh, I think the reason at least the Romans executed Jesus was because they thought he was seditious in some way that the, the uh, people thought he may have been a troublemaker, uh, maybe because he was a messianic figure, or maybe because he may have predicted something like the temple being destroyed and that was seen as a threat. I think all of those are possible reasons as to why Rome cared, because I don't think Rome would have just cared about Jesus blaspheming, you know, the, the Jewish God. And I, I personally think he did make claims like that and it made the Jews upset. But I think the the, Jew, the Jews, if they did negotiate with the Romans, would have done so saying, hey, this guy is a seditious rebel who might be trying to start a revolt. So I think that's what Pilate would have been concerned with. Yeah, that's a good point. And I, I think I think it's um, I think we should probably bring up when Josephus is writing about the uh, political environment in the region. He's talking about there being three sects of Jews, and he's talking mm -hmm. about the Pharisees, the Sadducees, but then he says the Essenes. The Essenes, uh, yeah. The Bible doesn't really mention the Essenes, but it mentions the Pharisees and it mentions the Sadducees being in sort of opposition to the Nazarenes, I guess you would call them, and, uh, which is kind of interesting because then you look at what the actual Essenes are according to Josephus and according to Philo, and there, there is this really peculiar sect that are very... Uh, they're really obsessed with like purity, washing their hands, um, not getting divorces, being very strict. Basically, if you actually compare, it's it's really strange because when you look at the Nazarite vow in the Old Testament, you can kind of see a similarities with what the Essenes are. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, yeah, like Samson kind of with the you can't drink wine and you can't you know, have certain. So there were certainly stipulations with with the Nazarenes, uh, and I think the Essenes do emulate quite a bit of that. Yeah. Yeah, so there, there's a connection there, I think, and um, so then, so the next thing is you look at what other what other documents do we have from that time period? Well, we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, the mm -hmm. Qumran, yeah, the Qumran community, and supposedly this is where John the Baptist was located in that region. So it's quite possible that they crossed paths, and there were maybe the same people knew each other. Regardless, uh, it does there is some some of the text talking about Johann and the high priest. Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure if that's the same person or not. I don't think he mm -hmm. is. But regardless, I say that all to say this is like in those Dead Sea Scrolls, they talk about the Essenes a lot. They talk about the Pharisees a lot. 
Mm-hmm. They talk about Rome a lot. They call him the Kittim, the Chetim. And the, the ships of the Kittim are coming to fight against the, the angels of light versus the angels of darkness. And they're talking about this war going to happen and that Israel's going to win, basically, though. So they get, they get it wrong. These guys get it wrong. Not this is not, I'm not saying this is the Bible, but this is different. Different script. Right. Right. So these guys get it wrong. They say that the Jews, the Jews are going to win against the Romans. Doesn't happen. But they're also talking a lot about two messiahs. In this text, yeah, one Ben them, David and Ben Joseph, right? Yeah. Yes, one of them being a triumphant son of David, the other one being a suffering Messiah who's going to carry out the law. So I don't know. This is where I, I want to. Maybe you might know about this. What happens to that, those concepts? Why does it kind of they kind of get meshed together into one? Because I guess I don't know. Jesus would be considered the suffering Messiah, right? Yeah, I think that's an interesting point. I don't, I don't know that much about the Qumranic literature as far as the specifics. I'm, I don't. Is is the Ben David and Ben Josef? Is that in the Qumran or is that in like the later Mishnah and Talmudic literature? Um, there's, it's that's in the Talmud for sure, then which is written okay. later. But a lot of yeah, that, yeah, a lot of that. I'm trying to see if that's. I don't know if that's post Christian or if that's pre Christian because I'm not entirely sure as far as the dating on that. But I, I think it is interesting to see that I do think Christians do have. Well, Paul clearly thinks of, of Jesus as a, I, mean, I think Paul and the Gospels all really try to make Jesus look as if he is a descendant of David. So yeah. I don't think, I think they don't think they would have denied that. But I think at the same time, his characteristics are more in line with uh, Ben Joseph, right? The idea of him right. being the suffering servant uh, in Isaiah 50, uh, 53. Although I think there is dispute as to whether Isaiah 53 is talking about Israel as a nation or, or whether this was some kind of messianic figure. I, I think it would probably be more towards Israel. Um, I'm not entirely, again, that's why I said I'm not overly familiar with the literature. I'm not sure that the concept of a suffering Messiah was clearly believed in Judaism prior to Christianity. I think most, at least most Jews, I think were expecting Messiah to be successful. Um, but as far as the whether they were two different ones, I'm not sure as, as the dating of those. So I would have to just remain yeah. agnostic. But it is an interesting question. I think the Christians were in, were showing some kind of characteristics in both of those. Yeah, and also you get the being traded or being sold for 30 shekels. It's like Joseph being sold for 20 shekels and it's by Judah, which is the same way or same way to say Judas in Hebrew, Judah, Judas, you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. you wouldn't say Judas in Hebrew. You would say Judah. So right. Judas is actually Judah. It's the same thing. So they had- well, yeah, they, a lot of, a lot of them had names that were transcribed that were originally, you could look at Mary is Mary oh, wow. you know, Miriam from Moses' sister, but that's why Mary was a common name. It was just the Greek version of that. So yeah, I think that, yeah, Judas and Judah, but those are also very, co- ever since Judas Maccabeus and the Maccabees, those are very common names. Joseph, Yeshua, Judas, all those were very, Mary, all those were very common names back then. So yeah. yeah. So yeah, so I don't know. I just wanted to throw that out there because that's a, that's a good question. I don't, I'm not sure if, the, if they had written about the uh, two messiahs yet. It might be, I could be. Yeah, wrong. I would just, I would just have to look at the dates of the. I just, don't, I'm not saying they didn't. I'm just saying I don't know as far as if they're in the, if they're in the Qumranic literature, then that's fine. But as from the ones I've read, I think some of them are in the Mishnah and the Talmud, which are a bit later. Yeah. Well. Yeah. So okay. So now what I'm basically what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to like figure out how we get from Judaism to this like Gentile religion of the whole Roman Empire, basically. Right. Like, yeah. Next thing to get the next thing we should talk about is Jesus Nazareth, the historical Jesus Nazareth. And um, what do you, th- I mean, so we have, we got outside of the gospels, we don't have much, but I think it's fair to say based on, I think the biggest, so I'll say this, I, I've been sort of leaning mythicist for a while now, but the two arguments that are selling me to there actually being a guy is one, the Nazareth thing. Now, Godless engineer loves to point out, so he'll put he'll be mad at me if I don't say this. And <laughs> and Dr. Uh Dr. Richard Carrier loves to point out that there is a verse that says the prophecy says he will be a Nazarene, which I don't even know where they get that from. I don't even think it's from the Old Testament. I think Mark cites that, doesn't he? Yeah, Mark says that. Maybe, maybe he does. I, I think so. Yeah. So the question is, where did Mark get that from? And why does it have to, and then, then the next question is. Is that why he's a Nazarene, or was he really a Nazarene? This is this is where I'm leaning to right now. This is where you're probably gonna, you're going to agree with. He really was a Nazarene, and the Mark was just trying to make it. Hey, we got to we got to make this work. You know, he's got to be 
He's from Beth. He was born in Bethlehem, but he's a Nazarene. So let's try to let's try to spiel this in a certain way to you know get the people to pay attention here. Yeah, think? I think that when you, we look at the history of prophecy, it seems to me that they were people at the time were looking for a Messiah because we know there are plenty of messianic figures, and they were trying to find qualities of it. And so um, when you look at like I'm trying to think, like people who read Mostradamus, for example, where it talks about somewhat vague things and they try to find parallels so you'll have people Nostradamus saying the great city will be set on fire and like oh 9-11 the buildings collapsed and was set on fire and New York's a great city it's like yeah. there are par- they're finding real life things and they're trying to connect it back to, right to, very to do vague because they're looking it's for a horoscope movie. it's like your yes. horoscope it's right. like something very vague and you're like yeah that makes sense that sounds like me yeah exactly yeah and and i think a lot of the prophecies of jesus are interesting because most of them are not messianic prophecies most of them it looks like they just took a random verse and it's like what what is that one like when it you know the as you said 30 pieces of silver i don't think there's any messianic prophecy says he'll be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver i think there's a verse about 30 pieces of silver that's drawn back to so i think that they were finding thing they they had events that they were looking for parallels same with like the flight to egypt I, no one read that verse saying, oh, the Messiah is going to be flying to Egypt. Because you have, you know, that verse and Bethlehem and Nazareth, and it looks like you have the gospel authors trying to to find all of this kind of mesh together in some way. So um, I, I and I think you could, if you look at Isaiah 53, I think that they um, saw Jesus crucified and they drew a lot of parallels to that. Um, and same with, um, you could say that with a lot of uh, mess- messianic figures. I mean, look at anyone who was executed by the Romans who is a, a great warrior. And you could say, yes, he was crushed for our transgressions. He was, uh, you know, bruised for our iniquities. Um, I'm not saying that they were prophesying, but I'm saying I think people at the time were looking for Messiah. And that is partially why when you have this charismatic teacher coming from Nazareth, well, hey, he's a Nazarene. He's a charismatic teacher. He's saying some provocative things about a kingdom. The Messiah the Messiah is a king. You know, maybe that maybe this is what what's going on here. So, yeah, that's yeah. true. I actually, fi- I actually ended up finding what I was talking about. It, it was there was a scroll known as the Son of God fragment. So it's very fragmented text. Mm-hmm. It's from the Dead Sea Scrolls from uh, Q two forty six. Just in case anybody listening wants to check and look into it, it is called the Son of God fragment, and it does mention uh, Daniel or a David like figure and a Joseph like figure. Uh, but yeah, so that's probably where that could be where it all started. That could have that could these ideas could have started from there and progress as they go along. But I just wanted to get that out there because I knew I thought I knew I read it from somewhere. Yeah, I didn't want to yeah, that's talk. interesting. Yeah. I I'd have to see how much of the text, like how clear it is as to what the roles are, because it you know how fragmented is it? I I don't know. But that's an interesting concept. Yeah, I think certainly Dr. that has, has uh, access to all that stuff, and it's so amazing. I love I love going to him for that stuff because he'll show you like. He'll show you right. these little tiny pieces of paper with like little cu- blurry letters on them. And yeah. I'm like, how do you guys figure out what that says? Like, we <laughs> this construction. Do. A lot of people yeah. debate and argue about stuff of what the what that little etch means in here and there yeah. if it's in bad condition. So it's yeah, that's fun. that's really interesting. So yeah, I guess that I, I guess that's interesting that you you said you're more in the mythicist camp, but you have a couple arguments that like lean you towards Certain things, and that's interesting. I hadn't heard the Nazareth one be one that like historicists bring up that much, which is interesting. I mean, other than when mythicists, really good to, argument. And actually, when mythicists, when mythicists say Nazareth didn't ever existed, yeah, I hear historicists about that, but I don't think yeah, most of the I don't think I've ever, say that. I don't think I've ever been sold by that argument. That Nazareth didn't. I mean, wow, we found houses in Nazareth. We've excavated. Yeah, was, no, and yeah. that I think that's like a that's like a a, a done deal. Like that's I don't yeah. think anyone, anyone serious is actually arguing that anymore. But yeah, uh, I don't think Carrier Price still argue that. So no, I know I know Price used to argue that, mm. but I think he's changed his mind. So whatever, there's a place. Whatever, I don't care. Yeah, that is kind of the night. That is the one thing that Christians, I think, are optimistic about is that there there are lots of times sort of history where people will say, oh, this never existed. The Bible was wrong. And then they end up uncovering it. So they will at least say, well, OK, there are, there's more there than we thought. You could look at like John talks about the pool of Bethesda and we don't have any other reference to this. It's like, oh, this is there's five pillars that represent the Pentateuch and this is all a symbol. And then we found it and it had five pillars. And that's what John, John wasn't trying to be metaphorical here. So, yeah. And uh, yeah. City so of Ur was for a long time thought to be a mythical city that Abraham was born in because they mm-hmm. knew all, they knew all about the middle East. They knew all about Babylon and where all yeah. these cities were, but there never was an Ur. And all of a sudden in like the early 20th century, maybe later mm-hmm. than that, somewhere like summer, like 1920, something like that. 
they uh, found it and they found the city of Ur. They on they dug it up and uh, there it was the the city right. of Ur. Like so, it's like so. Some so there's truth. That's the thing about the Bible history is like it's it, even if I don't believe that it all happened exactly the way it says it does. There's truth to the timeline. Basically. Oh sure. Even the, can, even in Exodus, the Exodus. Some, a lot of people say that Exodus never happened. Well, I could probably make a case that. If the Exodus didn't happen, you might believe it did. But if the Exodus didn't happen, at the very least, there was the uh, the Egyptians ruled over Canaan for like a thousand years, and mm. then right around that time where the Exodus happens, or you know, within within a couple hundred years, not right around that time, but within right. a couple hundred years of that time, they lose that land, and Canaan becomes free from the rule of Egypt. So there kind of was like a symbolic Exodus in a way, mm -hmm. and the Red Sea is. The divider between Canaan and uh, Egypt, so that could be them telling a story of how Canaan became its own nation. Well, it's even like when you have something like Noah's Ark, right, which is similar to Gil Epic of Gilgamesh, which is an older story. But there wasn't actually a, a pretty big deluge that flooded the region hundred tens of thousands of years ago, right. and you happen to have lots of flood stories from that region. So, I, I mean, I think there was some kind of inspiration behind that. A lot of many myths are based at least partially in history, um, or at least some kind of memory. Um, now, I now I would differ on uh, what other some people say is I don't like people like Carrier and so forth. I don't think the Gospels are of the genre of mythology or hagiography. I do. I would be with more of what the general consensus is that they are Greco-Roman biography. Um, now, I'm not necessarily saying that every single thing in them is historical, but I wouldn't say they about any uh, Greco-Roman biography. Every if you've ever read any ancient biography, even by Tacitus or Herodotus or Suetonius or Dio Cassius or whatever, you'll find incredible stories that no one believes happened. Um, but that doesn't mean that we throw them the entire thing out and say that they're not reliable. Um, just, you know, Josephus is a very, is generally very reliable. Sometimes his numbers are exaggerated, but he also talks about how before the fall of Jerusalem, a, a cow gave birth to a lamb and the iron gates, of the temple were swung open and all this stuff. Right. Um, but that doesn't mean, but Josephus is still reliable in other places. So um, yeah. And, and, and I, yeah. Herodotus is the same way. Yeah. He talks about there being one eyed men in the North. Where the, right. where the Scythians live. And it's like, he was right about the geography. The Scythians did live there. There's no one-eyed Ben. So it's <laughs> like, you get a lot of, a lot of the ancient historians do that. They, they just throw stuff in there for whatever reason. Yeah. But like you said, it is still reliable though. Shockingly yeah. enough. And I also would, I would also push back a little bit because there does seem to be a bit of a, uh, a schism in historiography to say that all of those are just legends. Now, there's a difference. You can say a story's not true, but it's not a legend. I don't think legend being this is a very long tradition that was added on later. Um, I do think in Josephus's time, people and Josephus says this people were. I think he heard people say, "Yes, I saw this cow do this, and I saw the gates open." And he talked about I people. He, he even says this is such a strange story, but I know many people who personally said they witnessed this of angels and soldiers in the sky during the fall of Jerusalem, you know, surrounding the city. And right. so I think people really did tell him that. And I think people really did believe that. Now you could say this didn't happen, but that's something you see as well with the gospels and with acts is people will say, well, these couldn't be early accounts because eyewitnesses don't ever say they saw miracles. These have to be later legends. And that's obviously not true because people still today report miracles. You can even look in India where you have people like Sadi Sai Baba, who has a million followers who, you have countless testimonies online you can read by people who are still alive talking about seeing all these things. Um, it doesn't mean that they're, you don't have to believe them, but it doesn't mean that they're all just hearsay legends that no one ever said that they personally witnessed. That's just not true. Um, so I think that we have to be careful with that as well. In fact, in the book I'm doing right now, which is actually on the topic of miracles, and as a Christian, you know, I would be more on the affirmative side. Um, I'm not saying we should believe every single miracle claim in history. You need, you need criteria to balance that out. But I do, I do advocate sometimes what's called what I call retroactive historiography. And basically that means that I think we can take some of the parallels we see in the modern world and compare some of that to ancient history. So for example, when Acts talks about um, people being healed and raising the dead and stuff, and then all these people suddenly convert, that makes sense if you were making this up as propaganda, right? It, it makes sense to be, to be invented. However, we do know that this happens in plenty of cases. Um, there's actually, was actually a dissertation done uh, on a group in, I think it was India, 
where there was this tribe of people and their son had died and they prayed to their gods. It didn't happen. And a Christian missionary comes and prays over him and he raised him dead. And almost everyone in the tribe converts to Christianity. Now it's a big Christian spot in India. And so the idea that people in large numbers convert because they see miracles or what they think are miracles um, is actually not nearly as, as ad hoc as it may sound. And the fact that acts is consistent with what we observe today in many regions, I think lends credibility to, to that in some regards. So stuff like that, I think is, is interesting to point out. Yeah, I know. I, I don't, I don't actually doubt that. I think that's, um, that's sounds like something, if something like that happened, they would all convert. Like, why wouldn't they? So right, it's, yeah. it's like, and so then it gets to the point where it's like, well, what happened? Was there really a miracle happening? Maybe, maybe not, but mm -hmm. either way, they, this, what they saw is what they believed to see. So that's what they did. You understand what I'm saying? Like, yes. So that question could be if, if that's really what happened, but it doesn't mean that they were lying. They they saw what they saw, and yeah. that's how they responded. So it makes sense for that point, for that stem. And, and yeah, and, and the historical method is always a tricky thing, right? Because there will be people like Bart Ehrman will say, well, we can at least say so-and-so happened, but we can't say it was a miracle. And I would say that I agree that purely based on history, you can't necessarily, but I also think that you have to have philosophy and epistemology to do history. You have to have criteria in the first place. The idea that we can even know anything that passed is a epistemic and a philosophical statement. So you can't divorce that from, from the implications. But there are cases in which I think we can say that the event happened um, and you can maybe remain agnostic as the explanation, but then you could do inference the best explanation. So Dale Allison, who is a uh, one of my favorite New Testament scholars, um, actually, I have his... Which one is it? Oh, no, I have it downstairs. Well, I have his, this is his old book. His new one, he, he mentions it as well, which is like an updated version of that on the resurrection. But he goes over some cases in history where he he basically says he doesn't know what the explanation is, um, but that are miracles. Like one he gives is there was a uh, a priest named Joseph Curpetino in the 17th century. And we have, uh, during his canonization, we have hundreds of firsthand testimony of these people saying that Joseph on many, many, many different occasions would levitate several like tens of feet in the air and would hover there for up to 30 minutes at a time. And this wow. was seen by peasants. This was seen by educated men. This was seen by the, even the Pope themselves. This was seen by Protestants who were very anti-Catholic. And we have hundreds of testimonies. In fact, there's actually a historian from Yale who talks about this and he's saying, historically, we have to say that something happened because we can't, unless you just want to say all of this is made up. We have all these firsthand accounts. Um, I don't know if I can say Joseph levitated or that it was a miracle, but uh, how do we, how do we explain why, pe why people at least thought that they saw him doing this? Was this like some kind of illusion or something? I don't know. So it's stuff like yeah. that I think is interesting. And I think that a lot of that does have parallels with early Christianity. Yeah, that's a really good point. What, when, when exactly was that again, that time period? Uh, that was the 17th century. Wow, so that's no. not even that long ago. I mean, no. it's a long time ago, but like, yeah, if you want to, well, my favorite one actually that I talk about that I, I, I talk quite a bit about it in the book that I'm doing. Um, Dave, I, I, you might be familiar with David Hume, the philosopher, who yeah, oh, yeah, had a pretty big essay on against miracles. He actually mentions this case and he just dismisses it, but it's funny because he meant he actually says, like, there were such a great number of witnesses, so he's almost conceding, like, yeah, there's a lot, but uh, this was also in the 17th century in Spain where, um, a man by the name of Miguel Piacero. Um, he was injured in a cart accident in 1637. Um, they treated his leg, but they had to amputate the leg because there was nothing that they could do. So they go and bury the leg in the courtyard. He's in a beggar for two and a half years. He gets a license from the Spanish government because he had to have a license to beg at the time because some people pretended to be disabled. Um, so he was verified disabled, did that. And in 1640, he wakes up and his leg is back. It's a little bit shorter and the blood is not completely there. Um, but over next couple of days it gets to normal length and he says the virgin mary has restored my leg back and so the, the they start an inquisition and we have um written documents from like the trial they have like where they interview witnesses and we have uh i believe it's almost up to 30 witnesses uh these people knew him before and after he was amputated we have the doctors who said yes i was there i cut his leg off and then they had the person who went and buried it in the courtyard uh, we have a newspaper from the time that talks about them going to the courtyard and digging it up and the leg was gone and the leg that was on the new leg that was on him had the same birthmarks and scars that his old leg had. And there's they had a big scar from where the amputation was. So we have wow. all of that. We have all of this. And Hume says, like, look, we have all this impressive testimony, even from doctors. 
Um, Protestants looked at this at the time, like the ambassador to England, who was an Anglican and the Anglicans hated the Catholics at the time, um, talks about this to, uh, to the king, and he was somewhat convinced by it as well. The scholars at Oxford at the time debated this medically, um, but we have a lot, a lot of firsthand sources of this. And Hume just kind of dismisses it and says, but, you know, but none of this is good enough to prove that it was a miracle. But I think that that just shows that, like, yeah, I think that we do have cases in history where a lot of people at least sincerely believe they saw something that was strange. And we might not know the explanation, but uh, it's it's a fascinating either way. And I think that when we look at history like that, um, we may not be so quick to just dismiss everything as legend. Maybe there is some truth behind it, um, wherever that may be. Now, on the same hand, I don't we also should not just accept every claim. It depends on, and I think both you and I would agree on some standards. Like I think both of us would say that um, when Herodotus is writing 150 years later and says, well, so-and-so heard the story from so-and-so that Aristius died, his body was gone, and then he appeared to people, uh, and he's reporting this a century and a half later. That's probably not the best source you could use because it's so late and removed. Um, right, so, right. so source. So if it's something that's written way later, same with like Apollonius of Tiana would, uh, Phil and Stratus didn't even start writing his biography until like well 200. over a century, two hundreds, yeah. and Apollonius died yeah. about one hundred A.D. So yeah, yeah, yeah. He Nine, didn't know any. He didn't know anyone who knew Apollonius. He, yeah, so it was quite far. Um, so like that's. So I think that's that's one. Also, accounts that come from um, sources who are very um, by well, every source is biased, but if it's purely for propaganda, so if you have uh, Julius, if you have Caesar Augustus's biography saying. He did such great works. He was a God who can control storms. And they're the only one saying this. And they have motivation to promote Caesar up as a God. Now, some people might say the gospels apply to that, but at least the, with the resurrection, you had this being proclaimed in a hostile environment, right? Yeah. Um, so that's another, that's something else you should kind of look out for. Or same with people when say, people say like, we have the Hadiths, the Quran, the sources that talk about Muhammad splitting the moon in half. We don't have any other person in the Eastern Hemisphere who said they saw the moon split in half, which you think you would notice, right? Or the tides would be the messed up. The whole world would notice. The I mean, whole world would notice, yeah. We have um, a million accounts, at least. Yeah. And in the, the Hadith we have uh, was written 150 years later through oral tradition, and we have just Muslims saying this. We don't have anyone else mentioning this. So that would be something that one would be, one would be uh, skeptical of as well, if it's only sources that are biased towards it and no one else seems to, to confirm it. Um, I'm trying to think of like, oh, and other ones that are just kind of mundane of like the rain miracle in Rome where you had them fighting an army and they pray and rain and lightning come down and hail. It's like, yeah, that's unlikely, but rain and hail and lightning are things. I mean, that happens sometimes. If you have enough people praying for rain, someone's going to get lucky right, <laughs> and get yeah. it. So that's I wouldn't know if that would be like a an impossible miracle that couldn't happen naturally. Well, that's like so. that's like with the. um with this, the stone that came down from heaven, that, right? That went into the Kaaba, right? Yes, now, yeah. That could have been a meteorite, right? There, we know that middle, happens. You're yeah. in the middle of a desert, so there's no trees and buildings that you can see very far distances. So if, if a meteorite does fall, you're going to see it fall. You're going to see it in the distance too. So someone's going to be like, "Look at that big light coming down. Go grab it." Right. And then all of a sudden, you got fire from heaven, or you got whatever. It, however, you translate that. And they're going yeah. to take that and they're going to bring it to the Kaaba and they're going to worship it because they're going to think it came from the, from the heavens. So that's not unlikely to happen is what I'm saying. You know, what's funny is that they also thought that meteorites, like I think this was like the 18th century. They didn't, scientists didn't even believe meteorites were a thing. They thought these were like hoaxes by people. They had what eyewitnesses say that they saw it fall and then they touched it and it was hot. But, you know, of course, by the time they brought the scientists, it just looked like a regular rock. And so they just said, these are just stories that people say about rocks falling from the sky. And this is nonsense. We know this doesn't happen. And of course, now we know that it does happen. But right. uh, that's just kind of the idea of people thinking something is legendary when it same with that. You could do this with, the, you know, it's funny in Hume's essay because he talks also about not he, he not only dismisses miracle testimony, but he talks about travelers uh, and voyagers talk about meeting these great monsters at sea and these animals. And, and Hume is writing the 1700s. At that time, they didn't think giant squids existed. They didn't think gorillas existed. They didn't think pandas existed. They'd heard these stories from the tribesmen, but they thought they were just legends. And of course, you know, now we know that's not true. So um, a lot of these stories that you hear of things are sometimes based off of real things that came up with it. So, um, yeah, I think there is quite a lot of truth to to legend and senses like that. Yeah. So that brings us to the, uh, the big kahuna, I guess you could say, the <laughs> story of Jesus. And right. Walking on water, healing dead people, you name it. He did it all. 
He did every, like everything that the prophets did in the Old Testament. He did them all. Like he did every single one of them. He did what Elijah did. He did what Elisha did. He did what uh, Moses did. He does does what David does. And so he basically the he's basically the amalgamation of all those characters. Right now, now I ask you: Do you think all that happened? Do I, I do I personally think that happened? Yeah. I, yeah, at least I mean there would be certain. If you ask me, do I think very specific stories happened? I mean I'm not saying that I would be one to defend every single thing in the Gospels. Um, contrary to some, of my, I have more conservative friends, but I think generally I do think Jesus walked in water. I do think he. I, it's not even controversial to say that Jesus was a faith healer who people believed healed sick people and exercised. That's actually almost consensus as well, just because. It's all it's it's in the Talmud. It's in it's in the parts of Josephus that may be authentic. It's in all the Gospels. Paul talks about Christians performing signs and wonders. So it's not stretched to think Jesus did as well. So all of that is, is I think, pertinent to thinking it's probably that case. Now, why do, why do you think there is such a gap between his life and the Gospels? Like 40 years, basically. I'm not maybe maybe I shouldn't say that because you got Paul writing a couple of, you know, right. A couple of decades after. But, you know, it's still well, what do you think they're why do you think there's not like some amateur manuscript by some random Joe Schmo living living in the Galilee that wrote down with his journal or something? Like not a journal, but you know what I mean? Like whatever mm -hmm. the equivalent of a journal would be in those times. Well, I'm not sure that I think most people back then were illiterate and writing yeah. was quite expensive. So I don't think you just would have, you know, five newspapers talking about this or something. That's so what I'm saying. Some some just random Joe Schmo who is one of the, one of the literate ones, one of the few literate ones living in the Galilee, and I'm, I'm not saying it has to be a hundred of these guys, just one, right? That's not. Well, I would say I would say that was Paul. I mean, he wasn't in Galilee, but right. <laughs> Paul would do that. And of course, I think almost everyone agrees. To some of the stuff Paul talks about goes back way earlier. I mean, Paul cites creeds and Paul quotes certain things, and and you can trace like something like a Philippian him back quite a bit earlier than that. And most scholars think there was a pre Mark and Passion story. So the story that Mark has. Mark is using an older, more primitive sources, and there's lots of reasons to think that it's older. I think the crucifixion, the burial, and the empty tomb narrative are actually quite primitive, um, maybe even pre-Pauline, and there's quite a few articles on why that might be. Um, some of that gets into technical because of the Semitisms and because of the lack of like theological titles. But regardless, I think there's quite ancient tradition there, and I think you can trace it back pretty, pretty directly because Paul... Um, Paul says in Galatians that he knows Peter and James, and of course, Peter and James know Jesus. So he is about second or third hand reporting from this, not including his vision of Jesus, but that doesn't really give us much information as far as him getting teachings, right? So I think it's also interesting that Paul doesn't usually directly quote Jesus, but he does. There are parts in Paul where you can have similarities to the teaching of Jesus you see later on. So Paul mentions, I forget the reference, where he, he implies the idea of like, moving mountains with his faith. And of course, Jesus says something very similar about if you have enough faith, you can make a mountain jump in the ocean. Um, Jesus also says, uh, Paul also describes the um, the Perugia, the second coming in First Thessalonians. He calls it like, uh, this will be the beginning of birth pains. That's actually what Jesus said when he's talking about the temple being sure this is, this is about the beginning of birth pains. So there is similar parallels where I think Paul is subconsciously having in mind some of Jesus' sayings where you have similarities between them. Uh, besides the parts like in first Corinthians where he directly quotes the, you know, the past, the, the last supper and the betrayal and all that stuff. So um, I think Paul was familiar with a lot of the traditions. I don't think they were written down yet. Um, if you believe in a Q source or something like that, but I, certainly there were old traditions that were going around in Paul's day about Jesus. So, so what do you think happened? Okay. So now, now let's get in. That's fair enough. I'm just going to say that fair enough. Like if, if you're, for, for me to challenge that, we would just go back and forth. And I already sure. know well, if you if you want. I mean, if you want to challenge that, go ahead. Like, I'm not like offended. To, I know that no. we have to disagree, and that's fine. No, it's the reason. The reason why is because like I, you're. It's pretty. It's it's. I I have to admit, like people in that time period were illiterate. It was not. Ex it was very expensive to get papyrus. You had to take an animal skin and and like dry it out and stretch it out like rubber. It was yeah. like you can't just go to the store and buy papyrus like this. This was a hard process. You had to have a scribe that knows Hebrew. And but these are I mean, these are in Greek. So I guess it's a different that mm -hmm. that's and that's what I'm that's what I want to get at. That's what I want to talk about is how do you get from this Jewish clique of a scenes that are following this guy who says he's the Messiah mm -hmm. and uh, he does all these things, he makes all these promises. And how do you get from that to 
this is like the Greek speaking world who's into paganism and they're into Dionysus and they're into Zeus and Demeter and Lucius. And how do you get from that to that? Well, I think Paul is how you get from that to that. I think prior to Paul, you had Peter and James who were very centrally centered in Jerusalem. And of course, you have people talk about schisms between James and Paul as far as the law and, and certain other policies like that. Um, but I think Christianity was a very Jewish thing. So I would disagree with um, some of the the more minority of scholars who think that this is derived, that at least the tradition, the original Christianity was derived out of some kind of mystery cults and paganism. Because I don't, although I'm not denying that those cults existed and that people like Philo and all the Philo's writing in Alexandria. Philo was, was writing in Greek too, actually. No, Philo was writing Greek, although he's in Alexandria, which is a bit more Hellenized. But Jerusalem was still very much um, anti-paganism as far as they were very much against having idols or statues of the emperor. I also think when you read Paul's letters, when you have the Christians talking about how Peter didn't even want to sit with Gentiles and they were asking Paul, can we eat food that's been blessed or that's been put to idols? I don't see these people as being very much, oh yeah, these pagans have some cool, cool ideas. Let's adapt them. I think they were very, they knew about the pagan ideas, but I think they were very off put by them and they were very uncomfortable. And Paul even says, you know, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jew, or sorry, foolishness to the Jews and stumbling block to the Gentiles. I mean, I think it's the other way around, but the point being, Paul doesn't seem to think this is something that is, very derivative of either Judaism or Hellenization. I think he thinks it's something entirely different. I, well, um, I was going to, I'm not even really disagreeing with you. I'm like, to sort of like, to agree with what you're saying, I think Philo is a prime example of proof that there was Greek speaking Jews everywhere already before, sure. before the time of Paul. So when Paul, by the time we get to Paul, by the time we get to the 50s and 60s, there is already a culture of Greek speaking Jews who are waiting for a Messiah or believe the Messiah already came one to the other. Mm -hmm. So I think the, uh, the atmosphere was already ripe for the taking for someone like Paul to come along. And oh, sure. The away. environment was certainly there. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not that surprised anymore. I it used to, it used to be my big wonder of how the hell you get from this Jewish cults to this, to Greek manuscripts and there's no hebrew basically there's really not a lot of hebrew especially in right. christianity there's like none i don't think right i mean is there any hebrew christian manuscripts or no uh no hebrew is more in the old testament uh um, right exactly. the old testament's hebrew except for daniel and i think ezra have some partially have some aramaic aramaic right, right. um Which although there are there are aramaic semitisms in the gospels and and stuff so you have Although it's Greek, you can tell that it's been transliterated and that it originally has an Aramaic source. A lot of the sayings of Jesus are like that. Yeah. Um, or it's like when Paul calls Peter Kephas instead of Peter, like those those kind of have more Aramaic roots. So I think I, I would imagine that Paul and Peter spoke Aramaic to each other. But Paul is writing mostly to churches that I, I think all of his epistles are outside of Jerusalem. So he's writing to Greek speaking churches. So and of course, Greek was a trade language. So I think Paul obviously would have known it. Um, and Pharisees were educated. So, um, yeah, yeah, I don't think there's anything impossible about that. And so now we're getting into the 60s where the war starts. You got Nero as emperor, and he hates the Jews. And he, not only does he hate the Jews, but the emperors before him hated the Jews. Caligula hated the Jews. Yeah. I don't know if you ever read Philo's description of, of, of his meeting with Caligula. Uh, I, I've read, I believe, I think it's in Philo. I know the story where Caligula tries to put up a statue of himself yeah. and he walks, he's talking with Herod and Herod's like, that's a bad idea. And he, he walks out and there's this huge crowd of Jews, like an angry mob. And basically he's like, okay, fine. We're not doing it anymore. <laughs> Cause that's, that's the thing too. The Jews are, and that's also why I, I happened with Pilate too. It did. And that's where I think, I, that's why I think Christianity has very more Jewish roots. Although I, it did become more. Hellenized as it spread, but I think a, we're talking about the earliest days of Christianity. I think this was, I don't see the earliest Christians as being big fans of paganism because I think the, the Jerusalem Jews now, Jews in Alexandria like Philo might be different, but Jerusalem was still very much very anti Rome and they did not like things being put in the temple. They did not like statues. They did not like anything like that. And they were willing to die. In fact, that's one of Josephus' stories is that when Pilate tries to stop them, they got on their knees and put their necks up, like, go ahead, slit our throats. Go ahead, kill the, like, he was like, but, fine, you guys win, dude. Yeah, he and literally like, gave up. <laughs> it's crazy, like, crazy, dude. <laughs> yeah, you don't mess with the Jews and their laws. They were, they were not yeah, happy. They did not play around. But the reason why, the reason why I do think that early Christians were sort of like, sort of metropolitan, I guess you would say, with, with pagans and open, 
maybe not in Jerusalem, maybe not in certain areas, but I guess would in Turkey for sure, because Marcion, for example, and I know this is a century later, but Marcion, when he starts bringing his form of Christianity around, they would, they took it. They loved it. So Turkey, which is an Asian minor at the time, mm-hmm. was was like huge for Gnosticism and right. like different types of, I guess you would call heretical Christianity. But um, the reason why I'm saying that is because even Paul's writing about it in Romans, talking about, listen, you might go into a part, you might go to a church and they're eating meat sacrificed to idols. Who cares? Let them do it. Right. He's basically telling is he's basically telling the Jews that are like you know more devout, the Christians that are more devout. Like, just let them do their thing. We're all Christian brothers here. Who cares? So that makes me, that lets you know that this was a big deal, that there was a lot of Christians who were joining the movement mm-hmm. who probably had an upbringing in paganism, who probably oh, sure. were big fucking Dionysus worshipers their whole lives and then found Christianity. And we're like, oh, this is cool. I'm going to switch over to this. And like, you can't, you can't just like change them overnight. I think Paul recognized that. Yeah, I don't know if they would. I don't know if it was a oh, this is cool. I think it might have been more of a moral thing because yeah. the Christians were the ones who were. I mean, the pagans were the ones who were having all the parties and the orgies and stuff like that. The Christians were the ones who were much more sexually repressive. So yeah. I don't see. Yeah. I don't see them going out. I don't see the big partiers going out and be like, oh yeah, Christianity is so much cooler than we are. But I think it may have been more of like a somber, like oh, they're yeah. they're 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 more morally correct, or they uh, they they believe that Jesus was was the Messiah, was God. Which is um, why everyone hated them because they were like, they're, they're, who are these people that think they're better than everybody else? You right. Know? Yeah. They're probably, they're probably well, yeah. And then Nero says that they burned Rome down. So that's why. Yeah. Like, oh. Nero blames the burning of, of Rome on the Christians. And then that's what Tacitus tells us. And, uh, and so there's your, that's one of your earliest mentions of Christians in Rome. And the Christians also didn't want to, I mean, I think that Pliny says that Christians didn't want to worship the emperor and stuff. And that's what, because most of the other, religion the greeks didn't care like yeah we'll worship most of them acknowledged that other gods existed and so you would worship um oh not be sure you would worship athena but they wouldn't care if you worship zeus or something but well that, that was part of the roman imperial cult like plutarch writes about how the secession of caesars was a divine uh right yes divine thing like julius caesar was a god so then right. uh, augustus was the son of god right and anyone he adopted became part of that that uh that royal bloodline, which was Cassina's divine. Right. So they would have statues put up Ju- Jupiter Capitolonius or, or Jupiter Caligula or Jupiter, whatever. And it was like a representation of, of one of the Caesars, but it was Jupiter. Mm-hmm. So it was like two in one deal. Like, right. Which is why you couldn't have a statue of the emperor in Jerusalem because they would, because he, that was basically true. idolatry because he was a God. Yeah. He was, they knew that was a worshiping thing. Right. And they, yeah. they, so they, they, said they, no. were, they weren't wrong either. Yeah. They were, the, the Caesar cult was really a worshiping of Caesar. It was oh, absolutely. A yeah. And in fact, the Etruscan, it goes back to the Etruscans. The Etruscans were huge an- ancestor worshipers. They worshiped their ancestors. They, they believed in talking to the spirits of their ancestors when they were gone. And they would even keep skulls of their family members, like their great grandfather. They had their skull in their right. house. And they're like, oh, they could talk to him and worship him and give offerings to him. That's what the, that's the, that's the Roman. Uh, that's the Roman line that it goes back to that. Where I mean, and the Jews kept kept bones as well, but it wasn't for ancestor worship. They did it for the resurrection. They would keep the ossuaries, right? They wanted to. Yeah. They were very much against cremation. They wanted to make sure the bones were preserved for the resurrection. So different purposes, but yeah, both of them have body preservation in that sense, which is really interesting. I think that's why we have a lot of archaeology from there to show that's like, hey, you know, they kept we have a lot of bones and boxes from Jerusalem, so it's pretty interesting. It is interesting, and supposedly, I don't think, and I think a lot of scholars disagree with this. But in Jerusalem, in the city of David, there's a great, there is a uh, actual grave of King David. Now, I'm now I'm not sure if it's really him or not. But Th- that's ascribed to him, yeah. Actually, yeah. even in Acts two, Peter mentions that where he says, um, "David is there rotting; his grave is here to this day." But right. Jesus, God, did not corrupt, and I think Paul, I think Peter there is implying that. Jesus is no longer in the grave rotting. I mean, that's what he's like, well, here's David still in there, but Jesus isn't. So I think that you have that dichotomy. But yeah, I think that, I think there is still, it's still there today. And I think that uh, certainly people back then, and they would have plenty of tombs for people like Elijah and all the major prophets. Now I don't think that, I'm not saying the evidence is great that that actually was their tomb, but they have, we have people ascribing tombs even today. Actually, um, I, I personally do think now in Jerusalem, there's like two major spots. 
um, for the tomb of Jesus, the garden tomb, which pretty much no one accepts because the, the evidence for it is really, really bad. Um, and it's been dated to way before that anyway. Um, and the one that I think actually has a good chance of being authentic, which is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And that's the big fancy one that has a church on top of it, if you've seen it. Yeah. And um, wasn't that built by Constantine's mom or something like that? It was. And this, yeah. the history behind that is interesting. So Constantine um, wanted to go. He had his mom go there and was searching for all these holy relics. And she talked to the bishops and the bishops pointed to a temple that I think was given to Jupiter, one of the Roman gods. And she said, there is a grave under this temple. Um, and, be, and she, she says Emperor Hadrian, a couple hundred, like 120-ish AD, you know, early yep. second century. Emperor Hadrian saw that Christians were worshiping this spot. Well, not worshiping. Were congregating here, saying this is the tomb of Jesus. And so Hadrian built this on top of it to stop them, to, to intimidate them, and made this attempt to them. And so they go and knock. So um, Constantine orders this temple being destroyed. And when they destroy it, they find there actually is a tomb under it that's empty. And so they build a church on top of this and say that this is it. Now, what's really interesting is that isn't that where they found the cross? Now, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Uh, I don't think in the original account they do. I mean, there's there's okay. legends about the, but but we have so many nails from the crosses that you could, you know, we, there's so many alleged nails from the crosses. There's a couple of yeah, heads of John the Baptist. True yeah. crosses all over Europe. And yeah, yeah. So I'm not, I'm not. But I think this one. But the reason I think this one's more authentic, and actually, there's quite a, I, I think a good number of, I, I list them in the first book. A good number of archaeologists think there's a good chance this could be it um, because although it's true that you know this is a couple of centuries later you can trace it back to at least hadrian which is early second century and you can trace it back even earlier because the location at the time is inside the walls of jerusalem which goes against how people were executed the the gospels say he was executed outside jerusalem and that's also you know common sense because they didn't want bodies inside jerusalem however what was interesting is that later on um in 40 in the 40s a.d Herod had the walls expanded, so they were moved back, and those were destroyed in 70 AD. Um, so when they were rebuilt at the time of Constantine, the spot was inside the walls, and so they thought this can't be right. But when we actually discovered archaeology, there was another set of walls, and the spot was outside of those walls at the time. So yeah. these walls were about there around 40-ish AD. Well, so you know that's, what's interesting, though, is that Hadrian's only a few emperors removed from Vespasian himself, which is— right. Yeah. Which would be like the life of Paul, because you got Vespasian, then you got his son Titus, then you have Nerva, and then you got Trajan, and then Hadrian. That's right. It. Yeah. So it's not that far away. It's not. It really isn't. And that's what's. It. But what the but the point is is that if this really is a very late tradition, it's impressive that they got the spot right. Because if you were making, if you were trying to find a spot in the early second century or in Constantine's time, you would pick one that was in that was outside the walls. But yeah. they didn't even know that this wall, set of walls existed because they were destroyed at the time. So when we discovered them and say, oh, actually, the spot was outside the, the, the original walls, the walls that would have been there when Jesus was alive. That shows that this is a, seems to be a pretty early tradition because it has that spot memorized. What also is interesting is that we've uh, excavated the area and there's also other graves that date to the first century. It's a cemetery, actually, around that area when we did further excavations like the 20th century. So. Um, the fact that, that date, a lot of those uh, date to the first century, it's the right spot. It's the right kind of tomb. Um, it implies that it's been there since, you know, the 40s, because, again, this was a very late one. You wouldn't expect the spot to be right. So although we can't prove this was the original spot, there's nothing that disconfirms it. It's at least consistent with what it would be. So that's kind of that's why it's a probability thing. We can't prove that it is. But there's like with the other spots, we can prove that they're not because they either don't date right or they don't fit sayings or it's not consistent. This one's at least there's nothing that disproves it. Um, but I think that's just that I actually think that's an underutilized uh, piece of archaeology that a lot of people take quite seriously. In 2016, they um, took out some of the the um, I'm trying to think of what it's called, because there's a little or orifice thing where they have like a bench and the bench is not where the original grave was. It's underneath the bench. But there's like marble there and they dated the marble to at least Constantine's time. So we know that this is the spot Constantine originally picked but there's been a that, that church that church has been destroyed so many times because of the crusades and all and rebuilt and all that so we can at least trace it to say there's nothing that disconfirms this is the spot and it's perfectly consistent and i think the fact that they get a lot of things right implies it's a much earlier spot so that that's kind of where i'll leave that at but there yeah. are spots that are, are pretty like i don't think the talpio tomb anyone takes seriously besides james tabor <laughs> uh, of the one where they found the, the box of james and jesus and it's oh yeah yeah, uh, yeah yeah oh simon's uh what's his name simon or i can't remember his name i mean it's not simon actually but it's like simca simca jacoby yeah who found that 
Yeah, and he doesn't even th- the the archaeologist found it doesn't even think it's authentic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, and a lot of people they did a they did a conference I think in two thousand eight, and like forty eight out of fifty scholars uh, of archaeologists in Jerusalem didn't. It's so it. ridiculous, and the way the way the names are written on there it seems kind of sketchy to me. Yeah. Like, and there's also names in them that have nothing to do with the kid. Bible either. Like a little kid wrote like Neil was here, <laughs> England was here. Yeah, like it looks so weird. Though. It does. Yeah, the sketch is weird. Now there are names like Joseph and Mary, but those are all Yeshua. Those are all very common. We don't even know if the James one comes from that spot. Some people, yes, but yeah, does. Joseph, Joseph, Paul Seth. But there's also yeah. names in there that aren't even in the New Testament or not even in the Gospel. So it's like, who are these people? So you can't pick and choose to say, aha, this is, the, and not to mention Jesus wasn't a wealthy man. So this is this, people almost think this was like a, something that the priest might have had. So for all those reasons, it's extremely on, unlikely. I always wanted to, I want to push back on that for a second. On the wealthy man part? Yeah, because if he's really, if he really is from a, Div- a Davidic line, how do you, how do you go from being king of Jerusalem, king of Israel to 14 generations later and then you're, your uh, seed is poor. So, uh, and not only that, the Talmud says, now I know the Talmud's dating Jesus to like 60 BC or something. Like right. That. Yeah. Yeah. But I still, I still, I think, I think they are talking about historical Jesus. I, I, I really think that I'm, I, I know a lot of people are like, I think they just got the dating wrong. I mean, Irenaeus gets the dating so, wrong and he was in that. It's so obvious closer. to me. They're talking about a guy being hung on Passover, whose mom's name is Mary, who was leading Israel astray. By like, witchcraft, by sorcery. Like, yeah. you think that happened twice? I'm like, no <laughs> way. It couldn't have happened twice. So yeah. it's like, so I think they are talking about that, this, who we're talking about. Now, with that being said, if you keep reading it, it says that he, because of his family, he had an extra day of trial. So that means mm-hmm. he was a big timer. Right. I think that's true. Because think about it. You're, you're, you're a Davidic bloodline. How are you going to go poor? How How is the generation of wealth going to just... By the time it gets to Jesus, it's all gone. It's well, like, but I mean, it doesn't the history of the the kingship in like first first and second kings, first and second chronicles. I mean, you had a bunch of wars, and then you had them being conquered by Babylon, and then true. Alexander the Great, and then the Romans. So they didn't have this kingship but, other than the, the Herodian dynasty, other than the Herods. But they would that it was that was the that the Herods were not related to King David, to my knowledge. So no, they were actually yeah. they were actually not even Jewish. They were um, Idumean. Right. That's why so, the Jews didn't really like them because they were basically fake Jews that were ruling so over that's, them. That's yeah. a good point. However, in a patriarchal society like Israel, you would think that the wealth from David would would go down from and the, and this was this was a society that was big in um in in uh, transitional what do you call it from uh, hereditary wealth like they had hereditary laws and all that. Like if you look well, at didn't look at, didn't Babylon take most of the stuff from the temple and all the riches what Israel had anyway? They did, and it, but apparently they all got it back too. Under which king was it? I can't. Remember. Uh, uh, Artaxerxes. Yeah, or yeah, Cyrus. I think it was Cyrus. Yeah, yeah. Cyrus gave Artaxerxes. it all back. So, but you could be right though. They could have lost it all between. That. that is a good point. I'll, I'll, I'll grant you that. Now, yeah. Now, moving on from that though. <laughs> Uh, I think I did cut you off though. When you were no, I was just gonna. I was gonna make another comment of just saying, like, one of my favorite ones that people don't talk about is there's actually a, a shrine, a tomb of Jesus in Japan, which is kind of funny. They have a whole. St- they have a whole. Yeah, you can look it up on YouTube. They, there's it's a it's a small tourist site, and they have a document um, that allegedly was written by Jesus. It's in Japanese, and Jesus says that he um, didn't they die in the. That. They say that during his lost years, he went to Japan and where he learned. Too, I think. Yeah, and it, yeah, there's that's yeah. another legend. He went to Japan. He learned um, Shintoism and the art of ninja, which is what looks like miracles, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> and then he went back to Jerusalem, and, and that's where he taught this. And he didn't get crucified, but his brother Izukiri, which is a very Japanese name for a first century Jew, uh, got crucified in his place. <laughs> and so Jesus then travels back to Japan and, as a as a garlic farmer, and then dies at the age of 102. So we have a we have this document allegedly written by by Jesus in Japanese. Isn't um, that what the Indians say too? That he 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 sent someone else to the cross for him, and then he traveled to India and then became a sage over there. And started I to- think I think they might. Yeah, I forget which source that is. But the but these documents we have, which allegedly written by Jesus, I think they date to like the 19th century or something yeah. crazy like that. Which of course, because of course they would. So, oh, so like no one takes it seriously, but it is funny to think that just like this is such a weird spot to have it. I believe they also have a, a, a grave of Moses there. 
for some reason. So they also they want to take everything and make it Japanese and say, oh yeah, all of these people. In fact, they have the, that those same documents say that like all of the major religions, Muhammad, Jesus, Moses, all these people are descended from Japan and all this. So it's really crazy. But uh, <laughs> I don't think I don't think the uh, Israelites even knew Japan existed. To be honest, I'm not even sure that they. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. But I know the Christianity had a big effect on the world. Like even there's there's even some like modern Hindus that talk about Christ consciousness and mm. like Zen Buddhists who talk about certain aspects of Jesus being like, you know, you know, another Buddha or something like that. I think they call it. I can't remember exactly what it was. Somebody in the comments will probably say what it is. But, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So but but like how, now my my question is like. How does it get to that point? Because like. So from we were talking about the time of Hadrian, right, mm -hmm. where the Romans are still pagan and they're snuffing out the Christians and they're sort of uh, they're persecuting them and feeding them the lions. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden we get to Constantine and all of a sudden there's bishops everywhere. There's churches everywhere. There's this huge movement in Egypt and Syria and in, uh, in Israel and Greece and Turkey. And now the Romans are adopting it. And all of a sudden, boom, it becomes a Christian. It becomes the state religion. Right. That's, that's really the question is, how does that happen? Like, even from an atheist perspective, you have to be like, that's pretty impressive. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, say some may say divine intervention. Some may say other things. Um, I mean, historically, we can say Constantine converted and Christianity became a state religion. That was it. Right. That's like the short answer. Yeah. Um, as, as, now, I think I personally think Constantine probably had a Christian background. So I don't some people try to compare it to Paul because he had, you know, he had a vision of a cross in the sky before they were fighting. And it's like, Oh, this is God on our side. And that's why he converted, but he may have been raised a Christian and had those influences. So I'm not saying he was like completely hostile. Well, well I actually, sorry, lot, go ahead. my bad. I didn't mean to cut you. I was just going to say a lot of the uh, historians in the like second, late second century, early third century, they've, they briefly mentioned Christian, Christian bishops or Christianity cults and like, being basically like um i'll give you one example just because i'm just spouting out stuff right now right the when they're talking about under the king under the emperor Heli, uh, hemoglobus i think his name is hemoglobus he talks about wanting to take in the christian uh cults basically and bring them into the roman imperial cult and like sort of like uh mesh it with the apollo worship which is like that's strange. Why would he say that? And that's all it says. It doesn't say anything else. Right. And it's about another historian saying that in Egypt, the bishops of, and, and uh, scholars contest this. I'm just going to say that right off the bat. Scholars say this doesn't even make sense, but it does say this. And it says that the bishops of Christ, when came to Egypt, were forced to worship with the, the bishops of Serapis. Hmm. And they were like the same church or something along those lines. Yeah, I don't know enough about those specific incidents to, to comment. Um, but yeah, I think that I think there certainly was um, negative influence even early on. I think Paul actually talks about this in First Corinthians, where he's like, you know, y'all are in Corinth is in Greece. He's like, y'all are, are still sleeping with your stepmothers. You were getting drunk at communion. You were doing everything wrong. This is not how you're supposed to be doing things. And so they were trying to take that paganism and try to incorporate it. In fact, there's actually quite a few. Um, you probably know the the controversial passage in the, in the pastorals where it talks about you know I do not permit a woman to speak right. A lot of scholars I've seen argue that Paul is actually or well, Paul I know I know that that First and Second Timothy are not considered Pauline by most scholars, but we'll say pseudo Paul that the author of those texts is referring to a church of I think Artemis I want to say because he might be writing it to Ephesus and this was like a female led cult and yeah. so when he talks about that he might be saying, hey, you guys, look, religion in your area has always been a woman-led thing where it's temple prostitution, all this stuff. You don't have to do that now. You, you're you Christians. You don't have to follow that. So that might be why Paul is making those connections. I'm not saying that that's true. I think it's interesting. I don't know enough about it to say either way. But I do think that that shows that with between that and Corinth and other places, there were certain pagan influences that were trying to get in. And I think the Christians were trying to push back against it. And, of course, that's why Irenaeus writes against heresies. That's why Origen writes um contra Selsum. that's why justin martyr writes his apology they were all trying to push back against these these pagan critics of, of right Christianity. right the gnostics as well too the gnostics. the gnostics yeah you even see that a little bit in first and second john with the he who does not say that jesus christ is returned in the flesh is, is the antichrist because the gnostics were saying well 
he wasn't really he didn't really die he just looked like he died he was pretend he was he took on a form and it's kind of funny because you have um in the gospels you know jesus eating and being touched and i and i feel like a lot of people say that's to counter docetism but you have the reverse in docetist texts where they have like these proofs that he's not i forget which one it is but there's one where he's like walking on the beach with peter and he doesn't leave any footprints like it specifically says that like it's like oh he's why is Peter leaving footprints but Jesus isn't? Or where he doesn't feel pain on the cross. It's like he acted as if he felt pain. So they're kind of doing these other, these counterproofs to say, aha, he isn't actually a person. He's just right. pretending he's a spirit who's taking on he's form. the logos. So yeah. He's the logos. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's, that's interesting to see that kind of um, back and forth, um, which is also why I think it's just strange and, and a bit um, uh, anachronistic to think, that Paul somehow viewed Jesus and his resurrection as more spiritual because the weird thing about that is that that would make Paul more Gnostic and more docetist, which is uh, so not something that comes later on. And it would mean that you'd have the legend flipping back because you'd have Paul, then you have the gospel, which are obviously against that. And you have it going back to that. So it just seems easier to me to say that they started off with this physical human concept of Jesus. And then over time it evolved into this more spiritual concept, but it feels weird to go from spiritual to human then back to spiritual. I don't, that's, that's a weird way to say the legend grows. And I think you're adding in more complexity than it's required, you know, through Occam's razor or something. So, um, that's, yeah. That, yeah. You know what I found fascinating is like the rest of the rest of Christian history after all this is like the Western Roman empire falls to the, to the, uh, busy goths, right? The Gothic empire. But they, the church kind of remains in its tech, basically. And right. they, they just kind of take, they just kind of become the new tenants. And like, oh, we'll just take over. I'll become the Pope. <laughs> and then so then the East sticks sticks together for like another, I don't know, 500 years, something like that, 1,000 years. And then they fall to the Muslims. And what happens is after this is 1500s now. But what happens is you see uh, the, the uh, this is actually this is actually documented in history that the uh, the church of Constantinople got into boats and f fled to the north to Crimea to to um, Ukraine and, and Russia and they started the Russian Orthodox Church. The Russian Orthodox Church is actually a continuation of the Greek Church that mm. fell in, in Constantinople, but also a lot of them went into you know Germany and Poland and became the Protestants and you know the, the you know like they became you know basically basically long story short the schism always remained. There's always that schism between one, the, you know, the Orthodox and then the, the sort of Protestant movement. But right. while what no one ever mentions, though, I think this is the funny thing, is that the Coptics in Egypt have been there forever. And they've, they've even got conquered by Muslims and they're still there. Right. Yeah. The Coptics are an interesting group as well. They never get talked about. No, because you have the Eastern, the, the Orthodox, the Catholics and the Protestants. And then everyone thinks that I guess the Coptics are kind of Orthodox. Yeah. But they're not they're not Greek or Russian Orthodox. Orthodox. Right. They're their own thing. Yeah, they had their own pope and everything. Yeah, it's funny how how you've like countering popes, and and I have a Catholic friend who's like, oh yeah, we are, so we see we we have to recognize so and so is legitimate, or so and so is not legitimate. I'm like, do they care? Like, it's like, oh, thank you, Catholic Church. You said my pope is legitimate. Like, they're not gonna care. They don't take your church as authority. They don't care what your pope says. They have a different pope, right? So, I just think that's kind of funny, and that's why I'm not a um, I'm not a Catholic, although. It is interesting uh, writing, writing and researching what I'm doing right now because there are the examples I gave earlier. There's a lot of Catholic miracles stuff that kind of goes against my theology that I don't really know how to explain. But <laughs> it has I was going to say when I hear about miracle the, on the miracle side of things, or like yeah. it sounds to be more of a Catholic thing. Well, there are pro. I mean, if you go into Pentecostal circles, there's quite a lot of them too. But um, what's interesting is that. David Hume, a lot of the arguments he gave were actually um, he got it from Anglicans because the Anglicans did not like the Catholics. And they were like, oh, these Catholics have all these miracles and they're just trying to spread propaganda and all this is BS. And a lot of the Anglicans even thought that. And so Hume was like, oh, well, here's some here's some Catholic miracles that you don't think happened, but these are better evidence than the resurrection. So you're being inconsistent. Um, and so he wow. basically didn't because they didn't want it. They didn't want to admit that. You know, heaven forbid we we admit that a Catholic miracle happened. Um, so uh, that doesn't, you know, I'm not, I, I, as a, I personally think that like I'm open to both of them. And so I don't think that it's exclusive to it's either Catholicism or uh, Protestantism. That's why I'm non-denom. I don't, I don't think there's yeah, like I a single you. right denomination. And I think that 
I actually think that that's what makes it interesting. I think that contrary to a lot of Christians and fundamentalists who think this, um, that revelation through scripture has to be this like straightforward, here's what you need to know. I think it's more exciting and a much more interesting relationship in theology to have um, you figure it out for yourself, to have conversations like we're doing and debates and discussions. And that's how we learn and grow as people. Yeah. It makes us better disciplined than to just tell us everything we need to know because there's no room for growth in that. There's no room for discovery and, and learning things and deciding and you, and you get better research skills, you become smarter, you become more disciplined. And so that's, I think, why there's so much left ambiguous because it's exciting to talk about and to discuss these things. Yeah, um, I, I agree. So and I was, I was going to, that's the last thing I'm going to ask you is like, what do you think about the, like the Benny Hins in the Protestant world that, that claim to be faith heal, healing people by touching them? When we kind of can see, maybe it's not necessarily what they're saying there are. Maybe there are some ones out there that are actually doing it, but I don't, yeah. I don't believe that. Yeah, I, that's a good example because I think that most um, centered faith healers, you, I, I, I don't even think most, some of them I think are complete. There are ones who are like actual con artists as far as they know. that Trying they're to make money, money right? As, well, yeah, like uh, Peter Popoff. I don't know if you know who he is. Yeah, he was, of course. Yeah, he, he, had a, he had an earpiece where he was literally getting information. So like he knows he's a fraud. Um, yeah. Jim Jones, who had his whole cult, he he Can you imagine do, that's that's how he must be an atheist. Then I I would hope so because I I couldn't. If you're doing that and you actually believe what you're saying, but you're still doing that, you have yeah. that's something wrong. And the craziest thing is that he still has a ministry now. He's selling water. He's selling holy water now. <laughs> that'll get you out of debt. Which yeah. why, I don't know why anyone still believe like why people still buy it though. It's like he was literally he exposed. A, as a, he, he had a late four in the morning show where it, it would come on and be like, "Give us your money and you'll." And you'll be forgiven for all your sins. Just the more money you give us, the more you'll be forgiven. Yeah, and you're, and you're exposed. Wow. Uh, but yeah, so I think a lot of them, I think a lot of these are psychosomatic. So if the, the stuff I talk about in my book, I'm not doing things of like, I had back pain or a headache and I was prayed and I feel better, right? Or because that can be placebos or um, even certain um, ailments. People can think they're better when they're not. Um, people sometimes self-diagnose where they say I had so and so and now i'm cured and they never even had that to begin with they just thought they did because you know they went on web md or something and says oh this must be what i have they didn't get diagnosed by a doctor um so a lot of them are not credible and i, I would be the first one to say that so i'm not advocating that all of these are legitimate most of them probably aren't however with all of that being said i don't think that that necessarily uh makes me close to stuff like that happening uh, you just have to look at it and be careful there's a great book published by Dr. Candy Brown uh, at uh, Indiana University, which is actually where I went to college. Right nice. there. Yeah. Uh, and she is a religious studies professor. And she did a book published by Harvard University Press on prayer, on testing prayer. And she actually has cases of pre and post he, uh, prayer healings. of Like she has one of a woman who was uh, medically deaf where we have her um, audiography uh, tests in 2004, which she was legally like disabled, was on pension, all that stuff. She was prayed for at a Pentecostal meeting. Her hearing instantly came back. She went to her doctor and we have her post prayer test and it's significantly better. Then we tested her again several years later and it was still better. It was still improved. And so she is per now she's permanently healed. And when she was previously disabled, there's actually a couple articles published in medical journals as well. Um, one of them is of a woman who was legally blind and we have her pre and post medical records. She was prayed for and her eyes were fixed and she stayed healed for 40 years. Um, another one of a kid who had a tube in his stomach where he couldn't eat anything for 16 years, was prayed for at a Pentecostal meeting, instantly healed, documented by his doctor, all that stuff. So there is stuff like this that happens. I think people should be open to it. But, you know, we have to be careful. And I think we have to have criteria. Um, that being said, I, I do think Vinnie Hen is mostly a, a not a credible source. I know many, many cases of people who thought they were healed by him who were not. Um, uh, but. There is he. There is there are some I have that are medically documented, and I'm and I'm open to that of people who um, blindness and um, serious heart issues and stuff like that, where they went there and they I have their doctor statements and all that stuff. So I'm open to it, but that doesn't mean that I think that everyone they did. Um, actually, I don't know if you're are you familiar with Lords France of of how they do stuff there of that shrine. No, I'm not, not ringing a bell right now. So it's a really interesting because in Lourdes, France, they they have a um, a tradition where in the 1800s, this 14 year old girl said that she saw the Virgin Mary appeared to her. And France is very Catholic, so you know this is this is was accepted, investigated. Um, but people, but apparently the Virgin showed her this spring that was like of holy water that could heal people. And so people started reporting that they 
were healed of ailments. And so what's interesting about Lourdes is that it's a big shrine now. People still go there. Um, but they actually have pe many people claim they're healed and they actually have a medical bureau set up there. And these are not even like Christian doctors. You don't, there's no religious test. Some of them are atheists. Some of them are not Catholic. Some of them are, um, it's a, the only qualification is that you have to be a legitimate doctor and have the proper degrees and credentials and all that stuff. And so they will review cases that people submit when people said, oh, I was here and I thought I was healed. And they look over their medical records. They interview their doctors. Most of them are thrown out because they're not credible. Um, but every once in a while, they'll have one and they vote as a panel and it goes up into other places. And they had, they've had so far, as of 2021, 70 miracles that are officially recognized. Um, the most recent one was a nun who was in a wheelchair for 40 years as a paraplegic. Um, after she went to Lourdes and bathed in it, she stood up and took her boot off and was starting to walk around. And she's still healed 10 years later. Um, for complete nerve recovery. Uh, and, the, and they voted and said that this is not naturally explicable. Now, the medical bureau doesn't say this is a miracle. The, the bishop of Lords and the church officially declares it one, but they wait until the medical bureau gives a decision as to whether this is natural or whether this is inexplicable. So someone could always say, well, this is just something we don't understand yet. Um, some people try to say that, but there are ones in which I think are quite incredible. Um, there's, there's ones in Lords of a woman who had a crooked, like a clubbed foot that was instantly straightened. Um, there's one of a woman who had severe lupus that ate away the cartilage in her face. They said she didn't look like a human. She had oozing blood and, you know, very disfigured. Once she went under the water and came out, most of that had disappeared. And it was pink and it was completely healed, even though she'd been disfigured for years. Um, this was reviewed by the medical community and all that stuff. So there are some really interesting ones that uh, I, I don't know what to think of. And I think it's a, but I, I'm glad that they have investigations going. And I think that's a, good policy for the future as well. I would like to see that more with okay. miracle claims, but that's kind of just what I try to tell people just keep an open mind. Don't be so open where you just believe everything you read, but don't be so closed off where you say that this has to be um, false. In fact, I would just had a debate slash conversation with a uh, counter apologist. I don't know if you know him. We were talking about miracles and I got to the point of saying, you know, even if you don't believe testimony, what about someone if they have an x-ray or an MRI, right? Cause that's more definitive. And they said, well, those can be faked. I said, okay, well, let's say that their doctor came out and said, yes, I've looked at this. This is theirs. I can confirm it. I said, would you, he said, no, I would probably just disbelieve the doctor at that point. I think the doctor's also lying. And I was like, that seems a bit pejorative to say that the doctors are also in on this. It, it seems a bit almost conspiratorial thinking when you have almost like how flat earthers say, oh, well, all of NASA is just lying or something. It's just it's yeah. like at some no. point you got to have a reasonable thing of like, this seems a bit uh, pejorative. There's yeah, actually at the, uh, one, least, at, least, at the very least you just say this is incredible. This is something that's out of the ordinary. At the very yeah, least. and that's all. That's, that's kind of what I'm trying to push people towards. Even if they don't want to say it's a miracle, I'm at least because usually they'll say this stuff doesn't happen at all. Then I think you can say, well, okay, they change to say, okay, it happens, but we don't have an explanation for it. So they'll at least will admit, yes, this sometimes happens. Um, but like one one example that's it's actually on video if you want to look it up. Uh, Delia Knox. Um, now there, there are people who try to give nap. There's a response video as well, which I talk about in the book that I don't think works. And I don't go, I won't go into all the technical reasons why, but she was in a car accident in the 1990s. Um, I'm sorry, late 1980s, um, where she was paralyzed. She's a paraplegic in a wheelchair for 22 years. Um, and we have many witnesses to that. Her, all of her family members, we have plenty of pictures of her in wheelchairs. Everyone who worked with her, you know, there was no question about this. Um, in 2010, she was at a healing revival where um, she started feeling something in her legs. So she stands up and starts walking originally with the assistance, assistance of people. But next time she shows up a week later, she's walking unaided. And now 20, 11 years later, she's completely mobile now, despite, you know, being paralyzed for 22 years. And wow. some some skeptics were saying, well, maybe she faked being a paraplegic for 22 years. And a lot of people like that seems like a bit of a stretch to think that you would try to wait that long to stage it. And um, especially when you have plenty of photos and people telling her what she was way before that. And so now people are saying, well, maybe this was some kind of head injury she had. And you'll see that on like a particular response video. Um, she wasn't actually getting a spinal injury. But the issue with that is that when I looked at the medical literature, the only temporary uh, paralysis I could find from head injuries lasted a few weeks to a few months. We don't have any case that I'm aware of, of a temporary head injury where it lasted for 22 years. Um, the only injuries that last that long are typically spinal injuries, and those don't have a cure. Those are not recoverable. So um, <laughs> I just I, I don't think there's any precedent either way, and it's very interesting. But yeah, you can look it up. It's on. Uh, it was the the conference itself was filmed. If you look up Delia Knox healing, it's very interesting. And I have a whole section where I talk about ones that are on video. Um, one last thing I'll say because I know I've been talking a while. That's fine, man. You're good. Yeah, you're good. 
because uh, just while we're on the topic of videos and photos, there was a really interesting case uh, since you actually you brought up Coptic Egypt. There, there was an interesting case pertaining to them where uh, in the 1960s and the early 1970s, um, there was a figure that appeared on top of this uh, church in Zaytun, Egypt, um, that people thought was the Virgin Mary. They saw this light that looked like a figure and they said someone said, hey, that might be the Virgin Mary. It's her church. And lots of people gathered and saw this. And over the course of these years, you have tens of thousands of witnesses because this figure would appear a couple times a week, sometimes, sometimes like once every a couple times a month. It would the, the frequency would depend, but it was always on top of the church. And there were these wow. little luminous dub things as well. And you can actually look up if you just go to type in Our Lady of uh, Z E I T O U N Zaytun. I know exactly um, what you're there, talking about. Yeah, there's there's it, photos that the newspaper reported of this that people. The Gnostics took. actually call that Sophia. Do they? Okay. Yeah. Um, but but the, but this was investigated by the Egyptian government. They turned off all the power in the city, and the light was still there. They could they tried to find a projection device. They couldn't find anything within 15 miles. Um, and so even skeptics who came and said this is just kind of some light that people interpreted was that no one knows where this light came from or why it was always on top of this church. The best the only one I could find uh, was uh, an article that talked about earthquake lights. Um, but the issue with that is that. Earthquake lights are not even a proven thing. We don't really know if it's actually a thing that happens in, in geology. And even then, earthquake lights don't always go to the same spot only at night. They appear sometimes in the day, and they're not they're not consistent like that. And they don't appear for you know for three years in the same spot. So there's no. And Dale Allison talked about this too in his resurrection book because he's trying to say like, look, here's a case where many people thought they saw what they believed was the Virgin Mary, and he compares this to like the appearance of the 500, right? Where we have 500 saw them, many of whom are still alive today. We could say. Thousands saw the Virgin Mary, many of whom are still alive today, although some have fallen asleep. And he's trying to compare this to the resurrection. But regardless of what you think of that, he's saying, like, here's a case that I don't think we have a good explanation for. I don't know what to think of it. Um, but how many, how many analogies can we draw to history? And that's kind of just what I would want to leave that on is I think a lot of these are interesting. And I think that if this happened 2000 years ago, what would this look like and what would the documentation look like? And just stuff like that still happen today. So. I kind of leave it at that because I it's it's just yeah, interesting to me. You know, all this talking about, especially two thousand years come going by, it's making me yes. wonder, it makes me wonder what you think about the text, sort of saying, in, sort of like insinuating that it's the end of times is happening right away, like right, yeah. next tomorrow. And how does that keep happening for two thousand <laughs> two thousand years later? And it's still right around the corner. What do you think about that? Is there really? Do you think that that's true, or do you think that's just like sort of like a no, I actually am in a, uh, a Caption Christianity Facebook group, and I did a poll on that recently, and I think 70% of the people who responded said no, they don't think that the, Jesus will come back in their lifetime. So I uh, I don't, I think I'm in that same camp. I don't personally think that the end times will happen, but I also don't like the people who are like preterists. I, I'm a partial preterist. I think a lot of stuff Jesus talked about was filled in 70 AD, but I don't think that, I, I, you know, Jesus talked about the resurrection of the dead. And preterists have to basically say this is just a, a metaphor, but I don't think you can honestly read Paul and the earliest Christians that way. I don't think they, they thought that. So um, I think that that's something that still has to happen in the future, but I don't think it'll necessarily happen in my lifetime. Um, but so when he, when he told his uh, apostles, some of you won't taste death when I return, what was the, what, how do you interpret that? Yeah, that's, that's one of the, the, um, I think one of the best arguments you can make against the resurrection, but against Jesus being God, because Jesus, from all accounts, it looks like God, his, uh, pre he predicted something that didn't happen, right? Um, so it, some people will say it depends on the verse. And so that particular one where he says, some of you will not taste death until the kingdom of God has come. The very next passage is about the transfiguration. So some people say this is, he's saying that you will see the son of man transfigured. Um, well, some people think he's talking about 78. Good. Way to put it right there. It is. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, sometimes he says that the 70, when he says, you will see the son of man coming on the clouds. In fact, what I think is actually really interesting is that we already talked about how Josephus mentioned the armies in the skies at Jerusalem. That's actually very similar to Revelation. Jesus. Well, yeah. Well, Revelation's post 70, though. So uh, yeah. Paul is the best one. Paul in First Thessalonians, because that's pre 70, talks about the angel will sound his trumpet and they, the armies of God will gather in the clouds and all this. And it's interesting that that's very similar to what Joseph seems as Josephus says independently, as presumably um, happens there. So you see the similar idea. So there are some people who say, yeah, this is what Paul was talking about, where the armies of God literally surrounded Jerusalem in that sense. Um, but as far as the predictions, um, there's I, I would personally say that I think we had to take the whole sayings of Jesus in context. So there are other places where Jesus says 
this will not happen until every nation is heard. And obviously that didn't happen in the disciples lifetime. That hasn't even happened today. So it was spreading at the time, but not every nation had heard. So you could say Jesus is still within the context. He can't mean that it has to happen in his lifetime because clearly not every nation had heard. He also gives parables in which people are expecting something to happen. There's a delay, like the groomsmen and the brides and the people start goofing off and doing other things. And then the person comes and they miss out. So there's almost imp implications of there being a delay as well. So I think when you take wow. all of that, we can say, yeah. well, it's not entirely sure. Um, but I, I don't have like a hard nosed. I, I do know people who say that Jesus is talking about the temple and then at a particular verse, it cuts off. And now he's talking about the future future. So I don't think we can prove that either way, but I think it's plausible. And I think when we look at all of Jesus's sayings, we have to take that as a possibility. Um, so uh, I think it's a decent argument for the skeptic to use, but I don't think it is so good that it undermines all of Christianity, but that's just my opinion. That's interesting. Yeah. So this has been a really good chat and we should definitely do this again. Yeah. And uh, this is great. And now everyone that's watching, you've just attained true gnosis. <laughs> You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over you. Jesus.